Leslie Campbell. I'm the library director of the Wigan Memorial Library, which is just down the hall. Visit us lately. I would highly encourage you to. Uh, we had a wonderful expansion and renovation that the town supported in uh, 2009 2010. Um, we're very excited about it. We'd love to fill that space up. So we certainly hope to see you uh, in the library. That's the plug for that. Um, we, uh, every year we do a uh, town, local um, candidates night in March just before the town meeting and town elections. So I would encourage you as well to look out for that. It's a great way to get to know uh, the folks who live in town who are running for the open positions um, that we have here in Stratum. And um, certainly those races don't get the same kind of attention as our state races do. So it can be hard to find information um, about those, those people and those races. So I would definitely encourage you to look for that candidate's night, which as I said, happens in March just before all the other voting. Um, so tonight, um, I, I learn something new at every candidate's night, and tonight I'm learning that um, sometimes politicians are like kids in school, and they ask a lot of questions about how long should I speak for, and um, how is this going to work, and things like that. It makes me think of um, some of the school kids that my daughter's friends were. Uh, so, just to let everyone know, uh, this is somewhat informal in that um, our goal is really uh, to let the folks here in the audience, um, our voters, ask questions, uh, get some information about issues, about where the different candidates stand, um, uh, do follow-up on voting records, anything that you feel is going to help you make a good informed decision um, next Tuesday when you go to the polls. So this really is um, very much about you asking your questions. Um, if you can, when asking questions, uh, be as specific to the information that you're looking for as you can. That would be helpful both to the candidates and to everyone listening. So um, for example, if you know specifically you want to know something about an issue, go ahead and ask that, that specific question about that issue. Um, as opposed to just, how do you feel about gambling? Uh, that's pretty broad. But, you know, where, where would you stand on the idea of opening, you know, X number of casinos in the state of New Hampshire? Um, that's a nice specific question um, that people can give you some good information on. So we're going to start off um, asking each of our candidates who are here tonight to um, tell you a little bit about themselves and why they're running, and then we're just gonna open up the floor to questions. Um, so that's how the process is gonna go. If our um, representatives wanted to come up front as well, you guys are hanging around in the back. We have seats up here for everybody. Um, and because the issues are relevant both to Senate candidates and to um, House of Representative candidates. As I said, we'll do all the introductory information first, and then we'll open it up to questions, which may require answers um, from people running for any of the positions. Once they have their seats, I can introduce them. So now I know what order they're in. <laughs> Um, so directly to my left is Brian Grisette, who's running for state representative in Rockingham District 36. Next to him is the, the, that is a floatarial district. We don't knock on doors. People don't understand. Okay, but I can't explain it to you, so it's nice of Joanne. Um, uh, the, the district 36 is a floatarial district, um, which is a really important thing that you should all go home and Google. Um, but, however, Brian, Patricia Lovejoy, who's down at the other end, um, is the other person running in that district, and I know that they can explain it to you, but, so they are, uh, Stratum is a part of that floatarial district, so um, that didn't used to be a district for us, but it is now. Is that good enough, Joanne? Okay. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. That did put me on the spot. I knew it was called. Um, so to Brian's uh, left is Joanne Ward, who is running for state representative in Rockingham District 19. Patrick Abrami, who's also running um, as for representative um, in Rockingham District 19. Uh, Chris Nevins is here as a representative for Nancy Stiles, who is running for um, Senate District 24. Is that right? Yes, correct. Okay. 
the numbers are starting to get confusing to me. Um, to his left is Chris Munns, who is also running for Senate District 24. Everett Lamb is running for um, representative in uh, the House District 19. And um, C. David London is here running for District 19 representative. And Patricia Lovejoy, who is running in our Floatarial District, which is your word of the day. Um, Floatarial District 30. Now I forgot what it is. Six. Oh, it's the other one. 19, 36. Um, so uh, this information, it is a lot. I'm really glad that you're here tonight um, to learn more about it. Also, for your information, there are sample ballots available on the town's website, which is stratumnh.gov. So we encourage you to check that out, as well as a link to um, the state of New Hampshire's voter information lookup page, which is a great place to find information. There's information from the candidates on the table that's over by the door, as well as a handout about some online resources that you might find useful as you're thinking about um, your voting leading up to the election. So without further ado, I'm going to ask Brian to make his opening statement. From here? From there, if you want to, ask if people can hear you. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> I'd like to thank the sponsors for sponsoring this event tonight. My name is Brian Grissett. I'm from, of Exeter. <clears throat> I'm a fiscal conservative Republican candidate running in District 36, which covers Exeter, Stratham, Newfields, and Newmarket. Uh, the Volterio District, what it does is to ensure everybody has a right to vote. Um, any leftovers when they assign individual districts, uh, like for Pat in, uh, in District 19, the, the Stratham District, there are <coughs> leftovers. Um, that do not meet the 3,200 uh, person representation. So what they, the state legislature did was group towns together to come up and get that representation. So Patty and I have the privilege of representing the largest population uh, flotilla district in the state, but we still just represent 3,300 out of the 51,000. But the idea is everybody has a voice. Um, some of you know me as friends. Others know me from my past decade of opinion pieces in the Exeter Newsletter. Professionally, I am a complex system analyst. I'm known for my analysis of issues and my openness to listen to any and all opinions. I'm willing to work with anybody. Just this year, as an example, in Exeter, Republican and Democrat leaders came together to working to solve the great dam and flooding issues. I was one of those. Working together, we're able to accomplish great things for our future. Um, tonight, I have changed my opening as a result of uh, the last few weeks of campaigning. Um, unfortunately, for the first time in my uh, experience, state rep races have now become politicized, misleading and nasty. Examples are the political hate piece that was sent out attacking the Stratham Republican candidates. Last night, I was attacked by candidate Schlockman for daring to uh, characterize that the talking points the Democrats were using were not accurate. The points of civility and bipartisanship and taking credit for our balanced budget that were made last night and throughout the past weeks of the campaign are false. Democrats, including Patty, who am whom I've had a good relationship in the past, are now deceiving voters. I'm an old Marine, and I believe people are entitled to the truth and to make up their own minds. And I believe this is wrong, and that's why I'm speaking up. Tonight, I hope that we'll be talking about the issues that affect the citizens of Stratham and New Hampshire. And you have the right to know the current state of our state, to know that Governor Hassan, if reelected, is proposing a 19% $2 billion increase in next year's budget, and that most Democrat candidates, including Patty, are proposing to bring a sales tax to New Hampshire. You have the right to know that Patty, prior to voting for the balanced bipartisan Senate budget, supported the original party line Democrat House budget. Hundreds of millions of dollars higher in spending, higher revenue estimates, and new and increased taxes. 
was by one Republican vote in the majority, in the Senate, that we have the balanced budget with no fees, no taxes that we enjoy today. In New Hampshire, we have a stagnant economy problem. We can't compete with surrounding states due to our corporate tax structure. Due to overspending of the budget this past year, we're now facing a deficit problem, which will be carried into the next term, and it will require skilled and dedicated leaders in Concord to address these issues. Stella Scammon, who I've known for years, endorsed me because I have proven that I have the skills and I can work with anybody. It's time to decide what direction the state of New Hampshire is going, either higher taxes or innovative solutions. Thank you. Hi, I'm Joanne Ward. I've been in Stratum for 27 years, and according to some doors I've knocked on, I'm a relatively newcomer. Um, I moved to New Hampshire from Rhode Island. Um, we raised two children in town. Um, I have a healthcare background. I started in Rhode Island working with various groups in a teaching hospital. I've worked with the WIC program, I've worked with preschools, and then at the end of my career, I was working mostly in geriatric, geriatrics. I would, worked in administration with Meals on Wheels that served 1,600 people for Hillsborough County. Um, then I, uh, my last position, which I retired from in March, was uh, working in a rehab facility um, in Portsmouth. Um, we had foster children for four years, so I'm aware of what that network, the challenges with those young ladies were. Um, and now I'm the proud grandmother of three. Um, one's the latest is two weeks old. I served one term in the House of Representatives, and I served on the um, Health and Human Services Committee as well as on the Labor Committee. I was also a representative to the Business Coalition Group, um, which I thought was a wonderful committee started by um, one of the representatives to have those of us on committees come and report legislation that would, from, from our committees that would have an impact on the businesses. And then we would come up with a position statement for or against. And when we were voting, both in committee and um, in the House, we were more educated and providing more education. One of the nice things I did that was kind of fun to do, but it was happened very inadvertently through this business group, and it was um, meeting with folks from Red Hook Brewery. Um, they said, did you know New Hampshire has an antiquated definition of, bill, of beer? And because of it, they could not bring some of their products into the state. It was illegal. So they warehoused it in Massachusetts, and Red Hook in Portsmouth was responsible for distributing beer half halfway up to the Mississippi River, they said, and to Texas. And they would make their beer in Portsmouth. They would have to ship it to Massachusetts to mix it in the pallet so they could ship it back. So the employees were in Mass, and the revenue went to Mass. And so um, spoke to the um, Liquor Commission, and they brought together the lobbyists, the Liquor Commissioners, the brewers, um, the legislators, and everybody came up with a nifty new definition of beer, and it was not, let me add, to increase the alcohol. People assumed it was to increase the alcohol, but it was to use ingredients like coconut water that they use in Hawaii in some of their beer making. So um, the bill passed, and Red Hook was able to expand, bring the warehouse into the state, add, add, add positions and uh, workers. So that was one, one fun thing I did by finding out what could make the business environment better. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie, for having us tonight. Appreciate it. Um, Pat Abrami, I'm one of your state reps right now uh, for the last two terms. Uh, I've lived in town for 31 years. I'm originally from Long Island, New York, uh, son of a union carpenter. I got my bachelor's and master's in science degree in industrial engineering operations research from the University of Buffalo. I'm also now currently partner and owner of Applied Management Systems, a healthcare operations consulting firm. We employ 40, 40 people. Uh, I've consulted in over 420 hospitals in the country, in 33, 33 states, states specifically, in, over in my 40 year career. I'm a fellow and life member of the Health Information Management Systems Society. I have numerous papers to my, uh, my resume, as well as I published a book, Bringing Computers to the Hospital Bedside. 
I'm currently chairman of the ISE Advisory Council and the, and the mem and member of the Engineering School Dean's Advisory Council of the University of Buffalo. I'm a member of the 4,000 Footer Club, climbed below 48 peaks, over 4,000 feet in the state, and also got my new pads for climbing all 67 in New England. When my, kids, my, my kids were younger, I coached five different sports, girls and boys teams, as well as was active with the Boy Scouts when my son became an Eagle Scout. Each of those things gives me, uh, is kind of the fabric of who I am, that, and it, what I bring to the, to the state, to the state house uh, with me. My quantitative knowledge, my understanding of health care, uh, my appreciation of volunteerism in the state and community. So as I said, I'm a two-term state rep. I'm on the Ways and Means Committee. I've been on Ways and Means Committee for four years. I'm also the vice chair of the House Business Caucus, where we review every bill for business friendliness. I've got a 100% voting record. And believe me, there's a lot of reps who don't show up. I've got a 100% voting record. And I've also never missed a committee meeting. I've, I work well with both Republicans and Democrats. I have Democrats who come to me every day in the state house, especially on health care issues. If they seek me out, they want my opinion, and we help, I help craft and I actually help push certain legislation uh, which I agree with them on. I also file a lot of bills, a lot of constituent bills. I have constituents calling me all the time. My favorite meeting place is Steve's for breakfast. I'll meet you at Steve's uh, for breakfast and we, we meet and we craft and we, we see if the legislation makes sense. Or McDonald's after hours because Steve's, is, I'm from Long Island where diners are open 24 hours. <laughs> and I said to a guy one day, let's meet at Steve's for dinner or, and it was closed. Uh, I thought all diners were open 24 hours. Um, I answer every email and every, every call that I get, as long as it's from Strata. I, I do that. And I'm, I'm big on constituent services. I've helped many, many members in this community with issues. Most of them revolve around getting through the bureaucracy in Concord. I've taken issues all the way up to commissioners to resolve issues. And I will, I'd love to continue to be able to do that. And the other thing I do is I, I sit to myself, I represent everybody in this room, so I'm going to communicate with you. And ever since I've been a rep, I write an opinion piece once a month. It appears either in the Exeter newsletter or in the Seco uh, uh, Sunday. They've been nice enough to, to allow me to put my pieces in Seco Sunday, uh, more than not lately. So those, that, that's kind of my background. Real quick, the three major issues I see before us, and there's many issues, and I'm sure you guys are gonna, you folks will all bring up issues. The budget's always an issue. We, when we ended fiscal, the, 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 the biennium before this biennium, we had a surplus of about $72 million. When we balanced the budget this year, uh, two years ago, about 52 million of that was brought into that budget. So that means that in theory, unless revenues increase, we're in the hole starting this budget process by $52 million for the biennium that we're going to pop to. But the other problem we have is that there's been overspending that's gone on. Revenues have been right on the money. The papers have I've reported it. They can't believe how spot on our revenues are. Uh, you know, I like to pat ourselves and be a Boys and Maze member. I like to say that. I'm proud of that. But what happened was uh, the government decides that she's going to take a $4 million grant from the, from the federal government to advertise for regular Medicaid. Regular, not expanded Medicaid, regular Medicaid. And guess what, and that was in January. That brought in, and this wasn't budgeted at all, that brought in 11,000 more regular Medicaid patients, which cost us about $37 million a year, which wasn't budgeted. That's fine and good if we all agreed that's what we wanted to do, because now what she's doing, she's saying, well, I'm cutting back. I'm, I'm, I'm telling the agency to cut back. Well, guess what? We're cutting into programs that we all agreed we needed. Pat. Okay, okay, okay. That's one issue. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, bond rating agencies are on our case. We want to make sure our bond rating stay because of our unfunded pension liability. It's a big issue, 4.64. It's a ticking time bomb. I, I have an eye on that one. Um, they want us to increase rainy day fund and fix the med tax. We did a little bit of that already. Uh, we have to do a little bit more. And the third big issue that's just really breaking now is the electric rates. Uh, they're poised to go up 35 to 50 percent. 
And the reason for that is, as my friend from my dean's council, who works for National Grid, told me, an executive said, the pipe's too small. There's not enough electricity coming into New England, number one, there's, there's not electrical wires, and there's not enough gas pipelines coming in here for natural gas, because as we're converting all of our, our, uh, our coal and oil plants to gas, we need gas. There's not enough gas to come in. So that's something that we have to all look at and have a rational energy policy for New England, but also rational energy policy for New Hampshire. Thank you. I, I, I look forward to your questions. Yes, I am Chris Nevins, uh, and I'm here representing Nancy Stiles. Uh, she wanted me to tell you, first, she apologizes for not being able to be here tonight, but she had a pre-schedule before she heard about this meeting uh, in Manchester, an event. And, uh, and so she asked me to, uh, to fill in for her because she didn't want to uh, miss this, didn't, or, or for you not to know what Nancy has done and what Nancy uh, plans on doing. I'm a former rep uh, also. I had two and a half sessions uh, with a lot of these good people on both sides of the table and uh, are on the commerce mm -hmm. media and whatnot. But the way I got involved in, uh, in uh, politics, if you will, in state politics, one day uh, this nice lady knocks on my door and introduces herself and tells me that she's running for state rep and uh, so on and so forth, she gave me her position. That was Nancy Stiles, and I was really impressed uh, with her uh, demeanor, with her intelligence, and with her knowledge uh, of uh, not only politics, but uh, uh, the government business. And uh, yes, so I allowed her to convince me to run, uh, and as they say, the rest is history. Decided not to run and spend a little bit more time with my family uh, for the last session, and it's been a good break, but I've also been working on Nancy's team, so it's not like I'm just a friend, but also working with her. I, there can't be anybody in this room who doesn't know who Nancy Stiles is. If you read any paper, any newspaper, you see her in those papers every day. Uh, she is a recipient of so many awards that I can't off the top of my head uh, announce them all. The latest I know is New Futures, the alcohol program we have uh, uh, here in the state. Uh, it's not a state program, a private one that uh, is an alcohol prevention and drug prevention program. And uh, she was uh, given an award for that. Uh, she's been ranked as New Hampshire's second most effective legislator. New Hampshire's second most effective legislator. She's been working very hard for you this last session as a senator. She worked three sessions, or six years, as a state rep. And I worked beside her then. And uh, I was on several bills with her. And uh, I was just very pleased I learned a lot from her. But her sessions as a senator have also been extremely productive. And she's productive in that she can be sometimes the balancing vote on many of the important votes that uh, end up uh, being passed, if you will. As we know, there are two houses, the House of Representatives and the Senate, uh, that, uh, that are our legislature. And the Senate, uh, because they only have 24 votes, extremely <coughs> important. Nancy has been a big player uh, at the Senate. She asked me to tell you that uh, for this session coming up, she's basically got four priorities set up. Uh, sound budget practices, strong economic development, to uh, support students and an educated workforce, and standing up for District 24. Uh, you know, for the strong budget practices, I think we're going to hear a lot about that tonight. And that's good. I hope you do. I hope you'll listen to understand where and how uh, your state uh, spends its money. Politics do make a difference. Um, uh, you know, I'm not going to say good or bad for either side on my, from here because we all look at things sometimes a little bit differently. And we'll explain those differences and perhaps how they work. And I hope some of the questions you'll throw our way will be able to do just that. But she's going to continue to act, act, or, excuse me, advocate for conservative revenue estimates. And she's going to work along with Pat for that on the Ways and Means Committee. Uh, that way our projections actually meet revenues our projection for what our expenses are going to be are actually going to meet the revenues that come into the state. Uh, it's a great concept and it's one that she's worked very hard over the years to uh, make sure it's happened. Listen to all the stakeholders and uh, there are lots of stakeholders. Yes, there are lobbyists that uh, come to committee meetings that we've all served on and they, they've got a position and actually we'll get lobbyists from two sides of the position and we have to listen and we do and we make a decision and we vote. I need to ask you that. Okay, so I, you know, I, I mentioned those four items, and the time is at a minimum, but I uh, hope we're going to have a good discussion on maybe uh, some of the uh, anger that seems to be out there, what's been going on the last couple of years, 
uh, you know, smear tactics used on both sides. Uh, you know, I, I'm really upset to be on the outside looking in and seeing Americans being angry at Americans. We're better than that. We don't need that. You know, politics, you know, are, are very sensitive. We all got our strong feelings of the way our politicians would vote and do things, but we've got to do something better than that, and maybe we'll have a discussion about that tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Leslie. Um, thank you for pulling this event together. This is a this is a great opportunity for um, the, the folks of Stratum to, to hear about the candidates and learn more about the candidates. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry that Senator Stiles couldn't join us, but um, we will uh, we'll move forward. Um, I first came to New Hampshire in the fall of 1980 when I entered Dartmouth College to earn my Master's in Business Administration degree. I've spent a total of 35 years in business working mostly in the areas of financial accounting and human resource management for companies like Wheel of Render Technologies, Raytheon, Fidelity Investments, Fisher Scientific, and Converse. I married my wife, Melanie, 25 years ago. And we settled in Hampton for good 17 years ago. We have two children. I'm the only member of my family who did not graduate from Winnicott High School, <laughs> something that I have tried to remedy by serving as a member of the Winnicott School Board since 2012. <laughs> Uh, later that year, I was also elected as one of Hampton's five state representatives. I'm proud of what we were able to accomplish in the New Hampshire legislature these past two years, but I also know that we could have done so much more, and I look forward to, forward to discussing that with you this evening. Our state is at its best when everyone has an equal opportunity to be successful. This allows our strong work ethic and our tradition of personal initiative to flourish. I'm running for the state senate because I want to ensure that everyone who chooses to work hard, sacrifice, and play by the rules has that opportunity and can earn a decent living, provide for their family, and be successful right here in New Hampshire. I've ridden my bike over 425 miles across every one of the 11 towns in District 24, and everyone continues to be very concerned about their economic security. Everyone agrees that we need to create more good paying jobs right here in our state. I'm sure we have plenty of, we'll have plenty of time to discuss that this evening. But working families are also looking for us to make it just that little bit easier for them to get by. That's why as a state representative, I voted to restore some of the cuts in funding my opponent had voted, for, voted to make in 2008, 2011, I'm sorry, so that it would be more affordable for families in New Hampshire to send their kids to college in New Hampshire. I also consistently supported efforts to expand affordable health care to working families, something my opponent voted against four times, which cost our state $100 million and delayed coverage for the 50,000 people who were eligible by seven months. But we could have also raised the minimum wage to $9 an hour over two years. This small increase would help 76,000 of our friends, family, and neighbors currently making between $7.25 and $9 an hour. <coughs> we could have lowered the maximum that loan companies can charge on title loans from an astronomical 300% to a more manageable rate. And we could have eliminated education tax credits that divert public money from our public schools to private and religious schools. I voted for all of those actions. My opponent voted against all of them. Finally, People are also concerned about their property taxes, and I hope at some point this evening we have a chance to talk about the nearly $630,000 increase in stratum property taxes that my opponent voted for in 2011. So I'm looking forward to our discussion today. Okay. Thanks. Lamb. I'm Everett Lamb. Uh, I've been in town for just about 12 years. I'm a pediatrician with Core Pediatrics in Exeter, and for those who have been here for years, um, formerly Exeter Pediatrics. I uh, have a, a bachelor's degree from the University of Pennsylvania. I did my post-baccalaureate pre-medical studies at Harvard. I went to medical school at the University of Vermont, stayed there for residency, which was a wonderful place before relocating to the, to the seacoast. I'm a board-certified fellow of the American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, just a little bit more about me and some of my service. Uh, New Hampshire Magazine has rated me a top doctor in pediatrics for the last three years. I'm a Stratton Memorial School Board member, currently serving. I have two girls in the school, in the system. Um, I'm the former section chief of pediatrics at Exeter Hospital. I am an assistant professor of pediatrics at Dartmouth. I serve on the Richie McFarland Children's Center Board. For those folks who don't know Richie McFarland, it's an organization that's been here in town for about 40 years that serves developmentally challenged children. I am also a board member of the New Hampshire Vaccine Association, which manages the $25 million budget for the state's vaccines, and I have been appointed by the Commissioner of Health to that position. 
Uh, I also enjoy coaching youth soccer here in town uh, and softball. And just quickly, as a local pediatrician, I'm privileged to share joy and hardship and growth with our neighbors, friends, community leaders, and, and essentially your families. These caring and concerned Stratum citizens generously support health care, education, public safety, environmental protection, and campaign spending reform. This makes our community an exceptional place to live, work, raise families, and ultimately retire. In return, we deserve essential services that ensure our good health and safety, protect our environment, educate the kids, provide for the physical infrastructure to foster a robust economy, and create well-paying jobs. I wish to serve Stratum by upholding the strong traditions of our past representatives who believe in representing everybody. I plan to do my part by providing practical solutions. That's what I do as a pediatrician. I remain committed and dedicated to the community as a passionate advocate for health care and for education. And I seek your support so that I can offer sound solutions, provide thoughtful representation, and serve Stratum with integrity. I'm happy to talk more specifically about the issues, but we can do that with the questions and answers, so I'll let David introduce himself. David London, I moved to Stratum 33 years ago. I served for 33 years as an anesthesiologist at Exeter Hospital, where I was chief of anesthesia for 25 years and president of the Anesthesia Corporation for many years. I was on the um, institutional review board, so I have some experience with uh, governmental uh, relations with healthcare. I was one of the founders of the Ethics Committee. Um, I attended Harvard College, where I received a magna cum laude degree in biochemical sciences, and then went to Harvard Medical School, where I graduated in 1971. I interned at the Beth Israel in Boston, and after that I went out to New Mexico for two years to serve as a senior assistant surgeon in the United States Public Health Service with the Navajo Indians to have an incredible eye-opening experience of uh, another culture and another kind of health care. Subsequent to that, I became uh, an anesthesia resident at Dartmouth, and that's when I came back to New Hampshire. Uh, I did two years at Dartmouth-Hitchcock, spent a year in Vermont, and then moved to Exeter, where I was lucky enough to get a position and uh, meet my wife-to-be, Anna. We've been married for 32 years. We have three children who are all grown, and two granddaughters who are presently students at Exeter High School. Uh, until I retired a year and a half ago, I really didn't have the time or the energy to devote to public service. Uh, we were on call every third night, and uh, it, was, it was quite uh, a full-time job. So I'm, I'm happy now to be able to offer uh, my knowledge and uh, my experience to the town. My primary uh, topic, my, my most important thing that I think we need to do is to do everything we can on the state and local level to combat climate change. Uh, this ties in with just about everything, and I think that we need new ideas. We need to encourage the use of renewable energy. We need to uh, have laws that incentivize uh, rooftop solar and incentivize wind, because uh, we are not always going to have the natural gas, which we can't get enough of, and uh, we need we need to have new thoughts, new way of thinking uh, be, to solve these problems which are going to affect us all. I saw a great quote from uh, the mayor of Portsmouth today who said we should stop arguing about what's causing all of this and start agreeing on how we can respond to it in a positive manner because it is happening. I'm also obviously interested in equitable distribution of health care affordable, effective health care, and education for uh, all of our children. I've been blessed in my life with many opportunities, which I got because I worked hard and was in the right place. And I'd love my grandchildren and your grandchildren to have some of those same opportunities. And I think we need new ways of thinking in Concord, in Washington, at all levels to achieve this. I think we need to think globally and act locally, and that's my goal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to the library for hosting this forum, and thank you all for coming out. My name is Patty Lovejoy. I am a second-term Democratic rep in the New Hampshire House. I'm currently Vice Chair of Ways and Means. I have a business and finance background. I was a CPA with the international firm of KPMG Peabody for six years and a banking executive for many years. My background is a natural fit with Ways and Means Committee. 
I've lived here in Stratum for 27 years with my husband Joe. Um, we've raised our family here. I have a long history of community involvement and public service here in Stratum. I served on school board for 12 years. I've served on our town's municipal um, budget committee. I was PTO president, Cub Scout leader, um, and I've also been on the fair committee for the last six years. If you get a call from me in June, I am probably trying to get you to work a uh, shift at the admission booth, which most of these people at the table have gotten that <laughs> phone call before and will continue to get it. Um, uh, this last two-year session in the New Hampshire House was remarkably different than the one before that. Uh, climate of civility and bipartisanship was restored. New Hampshire proved that by working together, we can advance the interest of both the state and its citizens. As Vice Chair of Ways and Means, I was very involved with the development of the revenue side of the budget. As Pat mentioned, our projections for the first year of the biennium were spot on. We were within 0.14 of 1% of actual. And I would like to correct um, uh, a misstatement by my opponent. When the, um, the House does the revenues first, and we do them in January and February, before the tax returns are in, so we don't have all the information from the year before. We do our budget, it then gets sent over to the Senate. The Senate does it in April and May, and they have the benefit of knowing what the tax returns are that were filed in March and April. The Senate actually increased the revenue estimates that the um, House did by approximately $12 million for each year. Uh, the House did not have higher um, estimate than the, uh, than the Senate. Um, I was the prime sponsor on uh, a bill that restored and enhanced CHIN, which is the Children in Need of Services program that was all but eliminated in the previous session. If I'm re-elected, one issue that I really want to delve into is uh, school funding. Back in 2008, the New Hampshire, New Hampshire legislature defined and determined a cost of what an adequate education is. Theoretically, each town, you look at what's the cost of the education based on the students that you have, and you look at your statewide um, property tax. If the adequacy is more, if the cost of adequacy is more than statewide property tax, you should receive an adequacy grant to make up the difference. This has not happened. It has not been done fairly. Uh, Stratum is one of 19 towns that has never received the full amount of its adequacy. While there are other communities that are receiving millions every year over and above the calculation of their adequacy. This is not fair. Um, I just went through the, um, the 2015 grants that were just uh, released as to what they're going to be. And it's the first time I really looked at it in detail, and it really upsets me. I mean, <laughs> there were the towns that were going to be the donor towns that made a lot of noise, and they got it so that they would not have to pay anything back to the, um, to the state. It's time for the communities that have never received their adequacy grant to make some noise. Uh, that's an issue that I do want to work with. I do expect uh, the casino issue will come back up again. Um, I was one of the leaders in the anti-casino movement. I was actually the one who made the motion to ITL, which is say, basically to kill the bill. Uh, I do, uh, I wasn't planning on saying a thing more, but I do want to comment on a couple of items. Um, my uh, opponent, I could, but, okay, he brought up, that there was a negative mailing. There was a negative mailing, it was done by the New Hampshire Democratic Party. Federal law prevents a party from talking to the candidates and getting our approval. All of us were very upset when we got it, and in fact, I called Brian that day and said how upset I was that this thing was gone out, and I wanted to make sure that he knew that none of us had any prior approval. If we'd been asked, we would have said, no, I don't believe in negative um, campaigning. Anyway, I look forward to your questions. Thank you. I already have someone who has a question. Um, we are going to open it up um, for questions, so why don't you start us off? Mr. Mr. Robin, I'm just a kid. 
but even I know some encounters were lost. I know I've been pretty bad. I guarantee you would have had voted differently. Why did you vote against the minimum, the minimum wage in the first place? Okay, let's go through the history of the uh, minimum wage in the state. Uh, a couple of years ago, there was a bill to um, there was a bill to make to tie the New Hampshire minimum wage to the federal minimum wage. So when the federal minimum wage goes up, New Hampshire's minimum wage will go up automatically. So first, that's that's that. Now, there's subsequent to that, there have been various bills. Now, if you look at who really earns minimum wage, and you dissect the numbers, most of those people who earn minimum wage really live at home, still live at home with their parents. It isn't like they are indeed uh, on their own raising a family. I'm in healthcare. I can tell you right now that none of the hospitals that I consult in, the lowest paying jobs in, in the hospital are either dietary aid or a, or a housekeeping aid. And they all, again, no, where, no matter what state I'm in, they all make above the minimum wage. Uh, it, it, minimum wage is supposed to be a starting wage. Okay, You're not supposed to aspire to the minimum wage. You're supposed to aspire to something more than the minimum wage. And uh, that's why I, that's why I, I think that Right for, for right now, I'm okay with where the minimum wage is, and uh, I'm gonna leave it at that. Lack uh, of minimum wage? Uh, yeah, I, a couple, couple things. First of all, uh, New Hampshire used to have a minimum wage. Um, in 2011, the legislature, for some reason, decided that we should be one of the only states in the country not to have a state minimum wage. Um, so that's one thing. Secondly, I co-sponsored the bill that would have raised the minimum wage in two steps to $9 an hour um, by 2016. If the minimum wage in effect in 1979 had kept pace with inflation, the minimum wage today would be $9.47. So a $9, an increase in $9 wouldn't even have kept up with inflation. In terms of what that $9 increase, in terms of who that would affect, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, it affects 76,000 people in New Hampshire, 14% of the workforce. To make it more, to make it more uh, local, there are 10,000 people in the seacoast that would benefit from this, which is about 11% of the workforce. Now this argument that it only affects kids is, is false as well. 72% of the people that are impacted are over the age of 20. 36% are age 30 and over. 59% are women, and 14% are parents. And then the final point I would make is, you cannot live on the minimum wage. The minimum wage works out, if you work full time on the minimum wage, it's below the poverty level. So we need to do something. And the other thing is, by raising the minimum wage to $9, it would inject $65 million into our economy. And that's $65 million that gets spent immediately. It doesn't get put into a CD because these people have to spend the money, and there's a multiplier effect that leads to economic growth. But it's also a job. It's also a job. It's also a job killer. I mean, state after state that have raised the minimum wage, we see that 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 minimum wage jobs wind up going away because because businesses just can't afford that. Hey, McDonald's can't afford, or some of these other businesses that that uh, require they'll just convert to kiosks instead of having. Uh, uh, employees, so when it's, I was more, a, it's more than just a simple. I was a member answer. of the Ways and Means Committee when this was discussed, and there were businesses there saying, if the minimum wage does go up, we will eliminate positions. So yes, it would go up for some. Would the market basket in the neighborhood hire your 14-year-old and pay them nine dollars an hour? The reason we did away with the minimum wage was every time the federal changes the level, a new bill, new legislation has to get submitted to change the state. So what we did two years ago was to say that our minimum wage will mimic the federal so that we don't have to change the legislation every time it changes. Okay, thank you. Let's take another question. Okay. I'd like to come back to you on the minimum wage. Okay. Minimum wage goes up. All the costs go up at the food store and everything else. You're not even looking at the people that are on fixed income. 
You're going to hurt more people than you're going to help. Okay, one couple more comments on minimum wage. Go ahead. You stole one of my arguments. Um, I, there are studies that are cited, um, and that's accurate. There are just as equal amount of studies uh, from an economic standpoint that characterize the job losses and economic impact on our country to be more extreme. For example, the Congressional Budget Office, which is independent, nonpartisan, has projected that the raise of the minimum wage as proposed in Congress would impact over one million jobs, jobs lost. In economics, for every change in law, for any change in behavior, and for every change in cost, there are reactions and changes. For example, today I was explaining to my wife what happened out in California with the unionization of the um, workers. I supported the effort, but was just pointing out that there was an economic impact. Two things happened. One, with the raise in the, south, the wages for the immigrant workers, that you saw less production. The second reaction was a bunch of very entrepreneurial people, a businessman, and women, scientists, got together and did two things. Innovative technology. They then were able to eliminate jobs for low-skilled workers simply by using technology to do the same jobs because it now became cheaper to use a machine. The second thing that happened in the agribusiness side, in the scientific side, in the universities, they used genetic engineering to now make our produce able to withstand the mechanical process of picking and processing. There is a balance, a, an equilibrium that it has to be looked at. And in the issue of, when it comes to the minimum wage, the solution to raising people's wages is to have a vibrant economy. For six years, we, we had a nine-month recession and a six-year recovery. The way you create jobs is you compete on the international market. You export your technology. You, you use your innovation. That is how you create jobs. And when you create jobs, there becomes a, a shortage of labor. And you negotiate for higher wages because the businesses want the skill way. The way to achieve a rise in the minimum wage is through economic policies that stimulate growth. And that's what we need here in New Hampshire. For example, our corporate tax rate is higher than Massachusetts. It's higher than every state. We're, we're the highest corporate tax rate on term of business tax rate. Massachusetts is reducing their tax rate even further. How do we attract business if we're talking about, like the last legislature in the House, they propose to eliminate slash raise business taxes? We're already having problems creating jobs here. We also have to deal with the high energy prices. There's a okay, positive... That's too many topics. <laughs> when I think about minimum wage, I think about in small businesses, which is what we have a fair number of in our community, it's a very small increase for the owners of those businesses if they have good employees working for them. In larger businesses, wages have been essentially flat for workers. Uh, very much like the fixed income of the gentleman who made the point just a minute ago, which was, I thought, a good point. Um, CEO and administrative salaries have outpaced worker salaries by dozens of times. So to limit the lower bottom employees who are struggling to pay their health care costs, they're struggling to pay their rent, their utility bills, gas for their cars, we need to take a look at the workforce and figure out how we can support folks who are struggling where the folks at the top are doing very, very well, and that gap is widening. Can I just make one little comment? I, I, I was being very <laughs> New Hampshire is the only state in New England that is using the federal minimum wage. All of the other New England states have a higher minimum wage, and it makes sense in New England. The cost of living is much higher here in New England than it is across the nation. The cost of housing, which includes your includes property taxes, utilities, etc., are much higher in New England than they are in the rest of the, the rest of the country, and we are the only state in New England that uses the federal minimum wage. 
you guys could take care of winter. I need winter. winter. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Okay, we're going to change gears. Um, I heard somewhere along the line that we may be getting some more insurance companies into New Hampshire. So, Patty, I'd like to talk to you about that. Um, we were always a small business, and boy, it was tough finding health insurance for a small business. Um, for a long time, we went through the Better Business Bureau in Worcester, Mass, to get our insurance, but they don't have anything like that up here. Now we're employed, so we don't need it, but I'm just, I know a lot of people who are self-employed, and boy, it's tough getting insurance, so can you talk about that? Yes, we are, um, this, this last year we only had Anthem. Um, and Anthem had three different, and they had some multiple plans, but um, but it was just Anthem, and there were a lot of hospitals that were not included in that. Um, we have five companies that are going to be offering multiple programs on the um, exchange this time, on the health exchange. Every hospital is included in at least one, and I think they're all included at least in a couple of them. Um, I mean, myself, I will be getting my insurance off from the exchange. Um, my husband had retired and I was covert under him and that's expired. So I will be joining many people here in New Hampshire and you know, we don't want to get into a whole big thing about uh, the ACA, but if it wasn't for the ACA, I would probably have an almost impossible time to get insurance because I was treated with for lymphoma for almost 10 years. I've been five years free, so I'm, right. I don't have to go, go back to Dana Farber anymore. But uh, um, I will be getting my health insurance on the exchange and having five different insurance companies offering multiple plans with varying um, deductibles is, is going to help all of us. Um, so I'm really excited after November 15th is when it'll be open that we'll be able to see the, the full details of the plans and uh, I, like many people, are looking forward to that. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak to um, just so you're aware, uh, yes, we had one plan um, this past year. Uh, it was very difficult for them to come in. They were concerned about losses and market limitations. And my wife, Addie, you may know her, she's the receptionist at Exeter Hospital. Um, they, they played hardball. Um, essentially, if you don't want to um, take our rate, the insurance company rate, then we will exclude you. And they, they hammered the hospital. Um, but their fear was losses in this new experimental market. There has been a change. There are going to be five. That's the good news. The reason for that is actually, uh, most people are unaware, um, President Obama signed an executive order um, changing and adding a provision um, by executive order to the Affordable Care Act. And essentially what it said is that for three years, a limited time, the federal government, the taxpayers, will essentially guarantee their no losses and in fact will guarantee their uh, anticipated profit. So yes, we have lots of insurance companies coming in for this next three years because they're guaranteed um, their profits and, their, uh, and against losses. So it is a great thing for the next three years, but it goes away when full implementation of a bond. Hi. Um, this kind of goes along with the theme. Um, <laughs> um, I'm glad to see that five insurance companies, I work at Portsmouth Hospital, and they were totally let out, bumped off. Um, I just have a little story. And this is kind of goes back in history and um, voting records and as such. Um, my son had no health insurance for nine years. Well, he was a part-time student and working for a business that did not provide health insurance. The Affordable Care Act had not had been established at that time. And in uh, 2007, he broke his collarbone and needed surgery. The process he went through to finally have surgery was excruciatingly painful and humiliating. To make a long story short, he had no money for the upfront costs that were required, but he was fortunate to have parents who cared and he got the surgery that he needed. Some people are not so lucky. And 
my question is, do we really want to go backwards because there has been a lot of blockage for the Affordable Care Act right from the beginning? I was very pleased when the Affordable Care Act was passed, even though it had a lot of problems. I am not short-sighted, and I know the kinks can be worked out if the legislators work together. I understand providing health coverage is expensive, but I feel we all have a moral obligation to help the most vulnerable among us. If there is a will, there is a way to do it. And that is what I'm talking about, is what you had mentioned about possibly losing the funding. By looking down the road as to what might happen, we will never get anywhere. In March of, and this is going back in history, to, to show the blockages that have been going on in Congress for this whole Affordable Care Act. In March of 2012, Representative William O'Brien stated, the House has already made clear their position on implementing the state health insurance exchanges to implement, implement Obamacare. The resounding answer to this federal overreach has been and will be, we will do all we can in New Hampshire to block Obamacare. Do you have a question? Yes, I do. Okay, could we get to Yes, that? it's about Thank Mr. O'Brien's voting record. Mr. O'Brien, since the Affordable Care Act and inception, your partisan voting has been in lockstep with Mr. O'Brien's statement to hinder the Affordable Care Act mandate and the Medicaid expansion for New Hampshire uninsured citizens. The Affordable Air Care Act is now a law. I expect my legislators to enact and enhance that law. Um, I would appreciate Mr. Obama's response to this, but to all the candidates, I ask, if you are elected, will you pledge to work and vote in a nonpartisan way to secure financing and enhance the Affordable Care Act? to make health coverage for all New Hampshire citizens a priority. Okay, thank you for the question. You know, Bill O'Brien's name comes up quite a bit. <laughs> uh, I didn't vote for Bill O'Brien for speaker, go on record. I didn't vote for Pam Tucker to be minority leader the last time either. I voted for Gene Chandler twice. So I don't, I don't, I don't want to be wrapped around Bill O'Brien as the mailer said I was, because I'm not. Um, I have to deal with the leader that I got. I got Bill O'Brien, he's my leader. Last time I had Terry Norelli. I didn't necessarily agree with, with Bill O'Brien. I didn't necessarily agree with Terry Norelli on everything. I didn't agree with, with, with O'Brien on everything. You get elected, you have to deal with the person that's in front of you as a leader. And I work well with everybody. That's my mantra, and I've done this all my life. And, that's why I've been so successful at business as well, uh, consulting with over 400 clients. You just don't do that by mistake. So, as far as the Affordable Care Act, first off, it's a federal issue. Okay, the only thing that the House did uh, during the, the O'Brien era was said we don't want to go to we don't want to create a state exchange. If you're not, let's go to the federal exchange. We don't want to create a state exchange. And guess what? We're smart. It was a smart move because. Most of the states they went to a state exchange can't get them to work. And they've lost millions and millions of dollars trying to get them to work. So by our action, we actually we actually save the taxpayers of the state a lot of money. So so that and then if you want to get into a discussion about Medicaid expansion, that's that's another discussion, but I didn't hear that in, in the question. So uh, most of this is federal law. I don't, my, my big picture comment about the Affordable Care Act, let me, let me, let me back up. I'm a health care guy. Was, was this, could we do better than what we had? Absolutely. Okay. Was the system, did it need fixing? Yes. Was the Affordable Care Act necessarily the solution? Probably not. Anything that's 2,000 page long bill that has 20,000 pages of regulations can't be the solution. Okay, and it was passed by lies. Everything that o President Obama said was a lie to get it passed. It would have never passed if we knew now then what we know now about it. But do we need to, do we, are we gonna go back? Probably not. 
I think we need to fix it. Okay, now it's a federal issue. I mean, that's the, your congressmen and your senators federally have to, to work on it. We all agree, I mean, the things that they, the, the, they like to say the best about it is, you know, you can stay in your parents' plan until you're 25. Yeah, you know something, we could have passed that. I think, I think Republicans, Democrats could agree on that. But you didn't. You never brought it up. I'm not, I'm not a, I'm not, wait a minute. I'm not your federal, I'm not your federal, that's a federal issue. I'm a state representative. Thanks for the promotion, my friend. Thanks for the promotion. Uh, it, was, it was a federal question that was asked. I'm yeah. just a state worker. Okay. Yeah, Mr. Palmer. Yes. You, I understand you didn't vote for O'Brien. Did you vote against the bill? Which bill? I mean, that's the issue we're yes. talking here, not. Which bill? Right now, huh? on your mic. Medicaid expansion? Yeah. Well, there was uh, several bills. Some of it was to defund it, some was to um, uh, block it, take it to court, make it. I'd like to just um, make a suggestion. I definitely encourage you to pick up the handout that we have. There is, there's several links, a couple of links on there where it's very easy to get to um, people's voting records. Um, we probably cannot go through every single vote I know that's been taken on health care in the last <laughs> couple of years. So um, I would encourage people to do that as well as to speak to the candidates individually um, up more about about this issue. We can't cover the federal stuff here. We have to just cover the New Hampshire stuff. I'd like to give um, Mr. Johnson a chance. Let, Leslie, can I make a couple of comments about that, please? Just about that last Very question. quickly, and then we're going to okay. move on. Couple, just a couple quick things. First of all, I think that state representatives should represent the constituents. You're not beholden to the leader of the House. We represent the people here in our town. Second of all, I also think that it's a federal issue because back when this was brought before the New Hampshire House, they punted it. Rather than coming up with a plan that would work for our state, they decided to go with a federal exchange, and we had difficulty finding competitive plans to come in, and one plan was offered. So no solutions were offered. I believe that all people should have access to affordable and comprehensive health care. I also favor expanded access, ending coverage discrimination, <coughs> controlling health care costs, but you need to promote quality and transparency, which is not really happening yet either. I also think that we shouldn't necessarily have government interference in private medical and family decisions. And I say that as a physician who behind closed doors every day has conversations with families. We need confidential access and we also need comprehensive reproductive health care for women because that's not an issue between the government and patients and families. It's between doctors and patients. So I think that we can do better. We went from one plan with 10 hospitals out of 26 participating. We're now going to five plans to 25 out of the state's 26 hospitals. I think that that's a step in the right direction. And what it's done is it's actually limiting Anthem from increasing their rates for the first time in many, many years. And it's making a big difference as in our own SAU as we look at negotiating with the teachers because there's a teacher contract coming up and what's going to be offered to them. And in the rest of the contract bargaining units around the SAU. Thanks. <laughs> um, Dr. Lamb, you just said something that just confused me relative to okay, the clarify. Affordable Care Act as it relates to New Hampshire. If I heard you correctly, you just said that one of the things you don't like is the fact that government intrudes in the doctor-patient relationship. Did I, is that what I just heard? What you heard was the decisions that individuals make about their own health care is made by the individuals and the doctors. I think that, let me just, if I could take a poll of the folks in the audience. If, does anybody here have Medicare? Anybody on Medicare in the audience? Have you been restricted from seeing any physician in New Hampshire in the time that you've had your plan? No. 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 Does anybody have private insurance in, in the room? Has anybody been restricted from whom they can see due to their private insurance? No. A couple of folks. So I think that the government can, can appropriately regulate health care like it does with Medicare, which wasn't perfect when it was first rolled out, but I think we can move forward and come up with a quality program that serves everybody. But ladies and gentlemen, what you just had there was a comparison of apples and oranges. Medicare is a federal program that is controlled in this very specific fashion. It's been written in this very specific approach in terms of delivering health care. The Affordable Care Act is a completely different animal. That program actually limits where you can go and what you can get. For example, if you take a look at what the reimbursement level is for the Affordable Care Act versus Medicare, the Affordable Care Act reimburses at a limit of about 50 to 40 to 50 percent lower 
So a lot of physicians don't want to be participating, and that's why many of them are dropping out. So the question I had for you at the very beginning of this was, you didn't like the concept of the federal government uh, interfering with your delivery of, uh, of healthcare between the doctor and the patient, and yet you support the Affordable Care Act, which does exactly that. So help me understand. I think that the government could probably deliver health care at a better price than the private companies because in a state like ours where Anthem made about $96 million yearly over the past several years, that if we took that additional surplus and we put it to effective care for people who don't have it, we could probably insure a lot more people at a similar rate that we're now paying. Now you're really confused me because what you're basically telling me. We can talk about this after. I'm happy. I don't know the question. I understand because I just want to make sure I understood it. What you're saying is that the federal government can do something better than the private sector. That's what you're saying. Can you tell me in what instance the federal government has done anything better than the private sector? Sure, hey, Medicare for seniors. <laughs> just about everybody in the room is, is, is saying that, that it's working well for them. The military. So <laughs> don't put my soldier in time for the next day. So the VA system just. We'll throw them all out. How's that? Everybody who wants to discuss this after, this is your corner right over here. No. <laughs> this is a complicated issue. Very briefly, Brian, and then we're going to go to our next question. We'll be brief. Um, I'm not on Medicare, but I have done, I uh, was the guardian of my mother. Um, for eight years uh, before she passed, I took care of her billing. My father-in-law, who's 92 years old, lives with us, my wife and I, and I take care of his. I'm his POA. Um, there's a lot of things. When you talk about this difference between Medicare and Obamacare, two facts you should be aware of is that there, yes, it did impact. Obamacare's passage did impact Medicare. The Medicaid Advantage program has been totally altered, uh, altered with a whole bunch of phased in changes. My father-in-law was on, on Medicaid Advantage. The first year of implementation, we had a very difficult time in finding him an Advantage program. Um, and at the last second, a company came in from Maine. Another fact you should be aware of, these implemented changes are taking uh, are happening without your awareness. <coughs> My father was in the hospital in January 9th last year. What happened was I get the bill from Extra Hospital. I requested itemized billing. I got the insurance company bill. What they pay, they don't match. I call. 30 minutes, I can be persistent. I finally got after the supervisor. They were so fed up, they just basically said, okay, the reason there's a 2% difference, we're saying we paid them in full, they're saying they're not paid in full, you don't have to pay that, is because under the, the Obamacare, there was a required 2% reduction into what your doctor's being paid, and they're not supposed to put it in the bill. So when they sit there and say it's not going to impact your doctors, as these go through, doctors are going to want to get rid of you. You should be aware. So we have a lot of healthcare people on this panel <laughs> um, who know an awful lot about this issue. One thing that, that I really want to be sure that we do, not a single person who's sitting here at this table can vote to either make um, the Affordable Care Act stay or make it go because they're not um, at the level where that's going to happen. So I really want us to talk about what um, these candidates are able to vote on in the New Hampshire legislature. Um, and the things that they can have an impact on by being elected to these positions. So I'm going to ask us to pull back um, to questions that have to do specifically with what's happening in New Hampshire and what they can vote on and implement change in. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'd like to bring this back to Stratum and I'd like to, um, I'd actually like to start with Everett and David and then go to Chris and then Brian, and then here, because I'm, I'm really interested in the candidates that are running, and I'm sure there's reasons you decided you wanted to get in the race, and I'm sure there are things that differentiate you from uh, the people that you are opposed, in opposition to. So, um, I'd like to hear you talk a little bit about how you differentiate yourselves from the people you're running against and why I might 
go to the polls and vote for you as opposed to someone else. I am very concerned about the future of our children and our grandchildren, especially in relation to climate change. I believe in the science of climate change. I don't think it's really debatable. And I believe that we need to start taking steps now to mitigate the damage that is going to occur, no matter what we do. If we can decrease it, then our children and grandchildren have a reasonable hope of having a world that is peaceful and inhabitable with enough food and enough water. And uh, I don't see that sense of urgency on the other side. The other thing that differentiates me is that I am strongly pro-choice and I believe that women and their doctors should have the decision-making ability what contraception they want to use, how they want to plan their families, and I don't think the state should encourage employers to have that power. That, uh, based on my reading of the previous votes of, uh, of some of my opponents, uh, differentiates me from them. Sure. I, I don't know if I need to say any more about my, my feelings about health care, but I think that clearly differentiates me from, from some of my opponents. But I also feel that education uh, is an important issue and that it should prepare all, all children for participating in society and living in a democracy. So I strongly support um, public primary education through secondary education, and I think that every New Hampshire student who, decide, who desires a post-secondary education should have the opportunity to do so and access to New Hampshire's public colleges and universities needs to be affordable. And, and this was, the money was rolled back some years ago, there was some reinstated in the budget, but I think that health, uh, excuse me, education is becoming unaffordable at the college level. Um, I also think that when you look at campaign finance reform, I think that that's a hot topic because as all of our mailboxes, computer inboxes, voicemail boxes, every box is, has been actually deluged with information that's coming from very wealthy outside sources. I think we need to bring the politics back to the person-to-person -person politics that New Hampshire has traditionally been. Uh, so I, I am in strong favor of, as a state, supporting campaign finance reform. She gave a list of them. I did. Chris, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, I, I know that my opponent went to Concord with good intentions, but after being there for 10 years uh, and, and seeing her voting record, I, I have become disappointed in how she has voted on, on issues. Um, and I have become very concerned about um, where she is getting her campaign contributions from. Um, I think those are things that all of you should take a look at before you vote on Tuesday. You should look at voting records. You should look at campaign finance reports because it's very important that you know you you know that this, the person you're electing as your state senator is going to look out for your interests when it really matters. Um, and I don't believe that in several substantive areas that Senator Stiles has been acting in the best interests of her constituents. Um, and some of those areas I've touched on already, but I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll list them off. Um, the minimum wage she opposed. Um, she opposed the effort to reduce the interest rate on title loans. She um, opposed uh, expanding Medicare, um, uh, voted against it four times. Um, she and I disagree on the death penalty. I voted to repeal the death penalty. She did not. Um, she um, voted to against education tax credits in 2012, and then when she had an opportunity to repeal that bill in 2013, she did not. And the only difference is that in 2012, Republicans had a 19 to 5 majority in the Senate. In 2013, they had a 13 to 11 majority. Um, I like to think of myself as somebody that's thoughtful and able to look at an issue and come to my own conclusions. 
Um, I don't look to my I, I don't look to my leadership in the party for you know direction on how to vote. And I think if you again if you look at Senator Stiles' voting record on these major substantive issues, you will see that she votes in step with her leadership. And I think again you need to know that your senator is looking out for your best interest and not voting in line with their uh, their leadership. Brian, okay. Um, Go ahead, Brian. Very simply, I've had a very blessed life. I've been able to travel the world. I've had uh, with my uh, with Transport Airlines for 30 years. Um, I was in the Marine Corps. I had great parents, a uh, public school teacher, and a Los Angeles County Deputy Sheriff. I was given core values. I believe in those. Right is right. Wrong is wrong. Marine Corps, it taught me leadership. I went through the Marine Corps Officers Training Program. Brian, um, how do you differentiate yourself? Okay. How I differentiate myself is very simple. My job as a complex system analyst requires that I look at the big picture all the way down to the smallest detail. I look for the unintended consequences. And in regards to Patty and I, we, we've had a good relationship. Um, over the past couple of years, we're both qualified. I think I think in a different format. Um, too often I see all lawmakers too focused on a specific issue. I think we heard that tonight. But they're not looking at the ramifications. And that's the, how we end up in situations like we're at today. A well-intentioned law telling society how to do something um, it still doesn't make it a good law. We need to make sure that when legislation is passed that we're solving the problem and not creating a new one. For, and as an example, on the, uh, for example, down at Exeter, I was on Water and Sewer Committee for four years. $17 million water plant, voted down twice. Simple reason. I objected because no alternatives were looked at. Nobody read the, they, excuse me, nobody read the 865 page $1 million report. I did. They didn't. So I volunteered four years of my time, and along with four highly skilled uh, uh, individuals, engineers, we were able to reorganize the thought process in Exeter. At the end of the strategic planning and looking at the alternatives, we ended up now, we're building a $6 million water treatment plant, groundwater with cheaper operating costs. That's what we need in Congress, and that's why I've stepped up because I think I can bring those skills, the fact that I can bring people together. This year I just received, uh, I was honored, um, I received the Norris Cotton Bill um, for New Hampshire. The, the point is, bringing people together and getting people to talk and brainstorm is what's necessary to do good work. And that's why I'm running. Thank you. A little bit to back to education. And my question is, uh, how do we support uh, higher education here in New Hampshire, especially tuition at UNH? And I'd like to pull the panel uh, right down the line, uh, starting with Patty and working uh, to her right, and ask you how you support uh, tuition at uh, UNH. In this last budget, we were able to restore $100 million to the community college system and the university system. Given that, when you look on a per capita basis for how New Hampshire supports education, we're 50th in the nation. If we double what we spend, we are still 50th. We don't catch Colorado yet. They're 49th and they bemoan how little that they um, support public education. So yes, I do. we need to keep our young people in the state, and having one of the most expensive state universities to go to is not helping to keep our children in state. Um, and my son is an example. He's at Jacksonville University, a public uh, private school down in Florida. Um, and he was a decent student, but he was not setting the world on fire. Um, oh, <laughs> but uh, the, the scholarship that they gave him made going to a private university, and for him in a climate that's a lot warmer than this one, um, almost the same as what UNH is. UNH is, is very expensive. We do need to do something. And then it comes down to where do you get the money? There are issues that we can look at in New Hampshire. We incarcerate 
way too many people. When you look at the incarceration rates over the last 20 years, and considering that New Hampshire is a very low crime state, the majority of the people that are in there are for things related to drugs. We need to do a better job with how we deal with those kinds of issues, and we could significantly reduce the cost and the, the, the money that we put into the prison system is it's one of those things that just sort of makes your blood boil. And considering the people are in there mostly for substance abuse issues, and then we don't give them any help, so then they come out and they get right back in there and they come back in, we could spend a lot less money on our penal system and use that money to invest in education. Thank you. David? Uh, Germany offers free post-secondary education to all of their students. Obviously, they have a different tax system than we have. But we have to start thinking outside the box. As Mr. Grissett says, you have to think of all the consequences. There are consequences to unaffordable college education. And there's consequences to people who are indentured servants to their college loans for the rest of their lives, living in a house that they're paying for a house that they'll never live in, basically. Um, I think we have to be open-minded about revenue streams in this state. And I am not a financial expert by any means, but I, I really uh, agree very much with what Patty said about ways that we could divert money that's being not spent wisely uh, on other problems. This is an issue that's near and dear to me. Uh, when people think that he's a doctor, they, they have these fantasies of all of the money that I earn uh, and, and I'm able to save. Coming out of medical school with about $250,000 in college and medical loans, it's going to take me well over 30 years to pay that off so I can feel the pain of the folks who are now entering college as college tuition is continuing to climb. I am unable at this time to save for my own two children who are now in seventh grade and fourth grade because of my own loan burden. And I don't propose to have all of the answers. But one of the things that if I am sent to Concord that I'll be tasked with is being able to collaborate with the people who do and the people who are really micromanaging the money to figure out ways to come up and support a system so that we can retain some of these folks who will stay in our states, so we don't have brain drain, so that we can have good jobs for them and so that they're not saddled with the ridiculous expenses that they can have a reasonable life as they move on. Great. Chris? I'm going to take this opportunity to gloat a little bit and tell Everett that I only have one more tuition payment I have to make. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, um, I, you know, I, again, I think Patty did a great job of summarizing, you know, what the challenges are. I mean, the, the only couple things that I would add to that are that um, we are the third oldest state in the country. So we have an aging workforce, and it's really important that we keep the young people that we have mm -hmm. in order to fill the jobs that already exist. There are plenty of open jobs that, that, that we, we just don't have people trained for. Um, and then I agree with everything she said about the, um, the, the penal system, but I would also add that it's important that we, we make the investment in our mental health system because that also then will allow us to save some money that hopefully we can divert for, uh, for education. And then the last thing I would say is that you know, what's important is that we need, to, we need to back up our words with deeds and we need to be consistent in how we, you know, if we're talking about making education a priority, we need to be consistent about it. And we cannot do things like um, vote to lower the cigarette tax um, and then pay for that in part by cutting funding to our public schools system, which is what my opponent did in 2011. And we also need to be realistic about, you know, trying to plugging holes that we create ourselves in the, in the public education system that diverts money. So we just need, we need to be really consistent to make it a real priority. Great, thank you. Mr. Wow, I wish I had 20 minutes. Uh, I've been very quiet over here you because don't. I know you the rest of your <laughs> candidates are, are going to be busy. Chris, obviously, is running for office uh, with a very, very popular uh, state senator. 
uh, he's got a long climb ahead. It's going to be very difficult. I understand that, and I understand the supporters have to do that. But attacking her or saying, I'm very disappointed when everyone else, at least in the news media, and her, her, the people that she worked with, is, and, and being voted the second most effective senator, or excuse me, legislator, not just senator, but legislator, seems to defy just those, those comments. I mean, I would love to go over issue by issue, but let's, we start with education. And I'll, I'll keep it down to my two to three minutes as everybody How do we support would. tuition, affordable tuition at UNH? A hundred million dollars was cut out of the eight hundred million dollar deficit that we had that was passed on by the Democrats there several years ago. I'm sorry, but that's what it was. I wish it weren't. I wish we had the money, so things had to be cut. Out of that 800 million, 100 million, that's correct, uh, was cut out of uh, UNH higher education, certainly not out of our, our, our grammar schools because that's locally funded. Uh, that represented about 6% of the uh, UNH budget. All right, now, if UNH can't get by without, with all those billions of dollars that they get with a, a $100 million uh, cut, I mean, I understand there's going to be some pain when that happens. Uh, then they've got to get better managers, but I think they do have good managers. As a matter of fact, they have stopped uh, tuition uh, raises now for the last two years. Great, we're off to a good start. But what about uh, putting that 100 million back? Well, we, they, when I say we, I'm speaking as if I were Nancy. Uh, the reason they voted to put that back was not just a kumbaya, uh, just where we got to do things better that way together, but we had more money. They had more money in a budget, so they had $100 million that they could spend on it. I don't know how you guys run your budget, but in my budget, I can only spend at home what I make or what I bring in. After that, I, you know, I go into a certain amount of debts for long-term things like houses and education, no doubt about it, but for the basic, basically, we, we have to uh, spend within our limits. Not only did we not spend within our limits back then, but we, we borrowed money, we paid with borrowed money for some operating costs. And when you borrow money, you have to pay interest. That's the very first bill that gets paid by your government, both the federal and the state government. The interest bill is the very first thing you have to do. So we're paying interest now higher uh, than we paid in the past. And yet our problems aren't solved uh, by so, borrowing that stuff. Mr. Nevins, Nancy would support uh, Nancy affordable would, tuition when Na there's Nancy the money Nancy would to agree uh, with uh, partially that money could be saved in the prison system. But I would disagree with Patty in saying that nothing is being done about it. They do have programs that are being held. So do sex offenders. So do a lot of other people. The programs are there. Are they perfect? Will they get by? You know, we can we can beg that one. But uh, no, uh, we have got to get realistic about what we spend and uh, how we do it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Education is uh, <coughs> education is the most important thing that uh, society can do. So educate your young people. They're gonna they're gonna be in charge, they're going to be the workforce of the future. It's very important. Four years ago, we had a very, very, as, as Chris said, very difficult situation where we were $800 million in a hole. So we reduced the budget. But two years later, the revenues came back, and the first thing we did was refund what we cut. Nobody, by the way, nobody <coughs> wanted to do those cuts, but we had no choice. Governor Lynch let that, let that budget become law. He let it become law. <coughs> By the way, at the same time that UNH had to do a little uh, belt tightening, Dartmouth College at the same time had a $100 million problem. Dartmouth College reduced $50 million one year and $50 million the second year. You know what they did? They looked at, they looked at, at, program, at, at courses that only had five students in it and said, well, maybe we shouldn't be offering these courses anymore. They started to say, we have to think efficiently. Now, I mentioned earlier that I'm on the Dean's uh, Advisory Council of the Engineering School of the University of Buffalo. University of Buffalo is the biggest state school in New York State. Okay? What I've seen, the dramatic change that I've seen for over 40, 45 years since I was a student there, was that the, the level of inefficiency is unbelievable. What the faculty size is doubled for the same number of students. You have to ask yourself, what is going on, not just in New Hampshire, but what's going on with education in the country at the higher level? It's not just New Hampshire's rates that are going up. It's every college's uh, uh, tuition rates are going up every, every year. There's a bigger problem here that we have to solve in terms of the efficiencies. I've, uh, the, uh, we meet with Mark, uh, the, the Seacoast representatives have uh, once a year invited to Mark Huddleston, who's the, the president of UNH, his residence once a year. We have great conversations with him. 
trying to talk through solutions to problems. Uh, he has a lot of good ideas. He's a good man. Uh, to be honest with you, he's kind of hamstrung by his, his own uh, uh, union, his faculty union, uh, to try to do some innovative things to make, to make education a little bit more affordable. So, again, I will fund education as, as much as we can uh, feasibly do, short of a broad-based tax. Uh, I'm getting the sense that there's some members on the other side here that would support a broad-based tax. Uh, I don't support a broad-based tax because New, it, it, the lack of broad-based tax makes New Hampshire New Hampshire. And we are actually ranked very high in every measure, and I, I'll get into those later if I have a chance, but I won't do it now. Every measure, including we rank very high in the education of our kids uh, when compared to all other states. So just be aware of that. And we all, we, we manage to do this, and we always, number one state in quality of life. Guess what? We do this without a broad-based tax. Isn't that amazing? And because, because we are forced to think efficiently. We're forced at the state to try to be as efficient as possible. Do I want to fund UNH a little more? Absolutely. And I will, as we'll see what the happens to the revenues in the next, next, uh, you know, next year, and we'll look to, to do that if we can. Thank you. Joanne, um, I was part of the session where there were cuts made to the university system, and it was for financial reasons worth balancing the budget. One item that took me by surprise was um, the state gives money to NHPR, but within UNH's budget is a line item for them to donate to NHPR. So is that a double dipping kind of thing? And those were some of the things. They went through the budgets line by line looking for what to take out. Stratum is a town that has always believed in educating our kids. We have done everything that usually is asked for in regards to building new schools, adding programs, and we, we, we value that. Um, we had a meeting as, with le as legislators with Great Bay Community College, um, and the president said, you know, parents are upset with us that their children come here for a two-year program but take three because they do not have the right classes that they need to get through that two-year program. So do we, are we preparing our children for those programs? Um, we have children that don't always make it in the traditional system, and are we losing them educationally somewhere around the middle, middle school and above middle school where they need alternative thing, um, programs, and your charter schools, adult ed, your technical schools, and do we need to be looking at how to get tap into some of those kids that might be falling through the cracks and maybe getting them in line with the correct school? Um, if the money is there, UNH should have it. And the other side of that is, should the president of UNH be holding the legislator hostage with saying, if you don't give me the money I want, I'm going to increase the tuitions again? So a couple of ways of looking at it. Thank you, Joanne. Three basic points I'd make. Um, first off, do, where do I stand? I totally support education. My son, uh, one son's graduated from UNH, um, got his economics degree. Um, he's now an independent consultant. My other son went through UNH, transferred, and went through the University of Maine. I've attended a handful of colleges and universities over my career, uh, studying different fields. In Exeter, I was one of the promoters of the new uh, high school, when we built the new high school, simply yet I had opposed the renovation, um, simply because the analysis made sense that we could provide a better product and sell the old school to help offset. And everybody in Exeter agreed with that. I was one of those members that we, it changed the direction. So do I support education? Definitely. That is not the question. The question is, is throwing money at an issue the solution? I Sometimes yes, but I don't know that. There are multiple things I would look at. One of the issues, why is college costing people too much, these young kids? Why are they taking remediation courses? Because they're not qualified coming out of high school. They're pay you, they parents, they are, or in college loans, are paying for an education that was supposed to be free through the school system. That's one issue you can identify right away. Innovation in the, at higher education. Southern New Hampshire University now has the same enrollment as the University of New Hampshire at Durham. 
80% of their students are online and recruited from across the country. You've seen the ads. There are a lot of innovative programs that can be done. Um, in fact, in one of the forums, um, I think it might have been Patty that was talking about the improvements and changes um, and innovation that's occurring within the New Hampshire college system and in our private univers uh, universities and colleges. So do I support it? Yes. But just throwing money and saying that's going to fix it is probably not the solution. And throwing money at it, my question is, okay, anybody want to raise their hand? Who wants to have a state income tax or a state sales tax to pay for this? If that's what you want, we're going to have plenty of money. If you don't and you want to find a solution that actually addresses it at the least cost, then that's what I'm willing to look for and work on. Thank you. I would just like to ask the candidates who did not have an opportunity to answer the previous question as to why we should vote for them that three quarters of the candidates did. So I will know why we should vote for them. Okay, so those folks who are not new um, that are incumbents, uh, why don't you go ahead and answer that question. Let's start from this end of the table because we've been starting from that end a lot tonight. Joanne. Well, I'm not an incumbent. Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's all right. I'm going to it on you. <laughs> um, I think I have uh, different skill sets for with my health care back. I mean, I know a lot of us have health care backgrounds up here. Um, I work with people on different committees trying to look for a solution. So as um, on the Labor Committee, on the Health and Human Services Committee, and then on the Business Coalition. So what kinds of, what can we find that needs fixing that is easily remedied to make New Hampshire a better place. As I go door to door, I'm seeing, I'm hearing the folks I knock on do not want an income tax. They say New Hampshire is New Hampshire because of our tax advantages. And if you start that, like New Jersey or Connecticut, they keep taxes keep going up, property taxes don't go down, and our way of life will change here. Thank you. Yeah. I'm running because I love the state. Um, I've, I've lived in New York. I grew up in New York. I've, I've lived in Massachusetts. I've lived in Maine. I've lived in uh, New Jersey. So I get to tell my New Jersey jokes. Because I've been here for years. <laughs> but, and I, I came here and I said, this is Nirvana. We got services. I mean, my, my, my streets are plowed. My police are there when you need them. Firemen are there when you need them. You do all of these things in this state with no board-based taxes. I don't mind paying my property taxes because I can actually see where my money goes. Because we're keeping the money closer to, to the source. And that's the other beauty of New Hampshire. We keep the money closer to the source of where it's being spent. Because in any government, once, you, once it goes away, it comes back, the dollar goes this way and it comes back 80 cents this way. It certainly happens that way at the federal government. So. I like the model that we have. Other states that emulate New Hampshire, not the other way around. Look at all these other states with all these big taxes. They're all corrupt. They're all bankrupt. Most of them are, are going bankrupt one way or another. They deficit spend. They have all these problems that we don't have. We have we, uh, obviously, we have problems, but not to those degree. So that's a big thing. And again, like I started to say before, we rank, we rank high in it. Education of our kids, health of our citizens, quality of our environment, uh, low crime rates, okay, and we're always number one quality of life in this state, okay. And also, the other thing is we have the fewest number of people in, of any state living below the, the federal poverty level, New Hampshire, year after year after year. Now, I want to preserve whatever it is that makes this so. Okay. And to me, one of the one of the big pillars is the no broad based <coughs> because we still value self reliance, okay, and we still value hard work. And those are those are two core New Hampshire things that we should we should never lose. Once we lose it, we we don't want to create a culture of dependence, and that's that's what I'm trying to prevent: the prevention of a culture of dependence. I would I'd rather rely on the individual to, to bring out the best in themselves uh, to keep New Hampshire the way it is. So 
And that's why I run and I like people. I work very hard for the citizens of Stratum. You can ask anybody who I've helped. I, there's a few people in this room. Uh, I never, I never turn around a constituent, and I, I, I like doing that. Uh, I just something in me that that likes working for, for people of the, of the town. Yes or no? Uh, whether they like it or not, there's no. Uh, I don't want it today. Uh, no, not. It's, it's have to make a decision. Nancy Styles is one of those decision makers. She had a primary this year. First time there was a primary opponent uh, for Senator Styles, and why? Because of some of those tough decisions she made. So she may have upset some of the members of her, our own party uh, and uh, by pushing one or two votes that were very important, as she saw it, towards education, towards health care, uh, towards Medicaid expansion, and others. Uh, it's, that's not easy. That's very difficult to do. Uh, but she also made difficult decisions on budgets. That's not easy either. Nobody wants to cut. I'd love to be a politician. Yeah, you can have this, or we'll buy that, we'll have this program, that program. That would be wonderful. But we don't have the money to do that. Uh, we didn't have it, really didn't have it several years ago. Things are better, but they're still not there. So Nancy Stiles, she's presented herself. She's demonstrated herself to New Hampshire, not only when she was a representative in the town of Hampton, uh, but right here uh, in dist uh, Senate District 24. She has been your senator. Uh, she has been your uh, constituent uh, winner all the time. And uh, she deserves your vote. Thank you so much. Patty. <laughs> Well, I believe that uh, my background fits very well with the State House, especially um, Ways and Means. Um, I am somebody who really digs into issues. Uh, I, my 12 years of school board has uh, it taught me anything. It taught me how to work with people with very diverse ideas and come up with consensus. Um, I've been put into leadership roles uh, on a regular basis. I was on the Stratum School Board for only three years and I was chair for two of those three years. I was on the cooperative board for nine years. I was vice chair for two years and chair for two years. Um, so I've, I've assumed leadership roles and I think the reason I've been put into those is because I do work really well with people. Um, I try to find consensus but um, I do really do my homework. Um, I find out about the issues, and if it's something that I don't, I don't know that much about, I'll go to the people who do know about it. And hopefully we will all get home in time to catch some of Game 7 of the World Series. <laughs> <laughs> Darn sports. Um, I want to thank everybody. I know this was a long evening. I really want to thank the candidates. You're at a very busy point right now in your time tonight. Um, it's very much appreciated. I'd like to thank Paul DeShane, our town administrator, without whom you couldn't hear me, um, and who is always um, so supportive of these events. Um, and especially thank all of you for coming out tonight uh, to learn more about the candidates. I want to definitely encourage you. Um, I, I know you want to get out of these seats, but don't feel like you have to rush out the door. I know the candidates would be happy um, to speak with you more about um, any issues we didn't cover or more information about things we did talk about. We have some wonderful refreshments. So thank you again, and we will see you here on Tuesday, November 4th, uh, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. for voting.